Welcome, listeners, to www.ironradio.org, the website and podcast for all things strength sports and sports nutrition. With your hosts, Lonnie Lowry. Remember, Phil is like a gnarled old oak tree held together with scar tissue and bone spurs. Rob Fortney. And I'm telling you, the pain that I would suffer was ex- beyond excruciating. And Phil Stevens. Do it, Rob. You'll kill all those nerves. Thanks for listening. Good morning, everybody. Go to strengthguild.com. S T R E N G T H G U I L D.com. Scroll down to the Iron Radio Collections and we've got new shirts and new banners for you to support the show. Everything from just a regular banner, regular shirt, to ones with sayings on them, like Lonnie's Phil is like a gnarled old oak tree shirt. And some news for you we're going to have some contests for people who own these shirts and things. So if you support the show, we'll let you more on that later. So if you get in on these early, you can be one of the per- first people to win some prizes. So, thank you very much. Go check out the site, strengthguild.com. Scroll down to Iron Radio Collections and support the show. Welcome, Iron Radio listeners. This is Lonnie Lowry. I'm an exercise physiology and nutrition professor of about 20 years, and I'm a former competitive bodybuilder. So, Stevens here, powerlifter, Highland Games athlete. I run Strength Guild in Topeka, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad to not be the largest mammal on the show today. There you go. So. <laughs> nice. Uh, this is Dr. Mike T. Nelson, creator of the Flex Diet Certification, associate professor at the Kerrig Institute, and uh, I kiteboarded 60 miles here in one shot in South Padre, Texas. Wow. There you go. And yeah. today, today joining us, we've got Dan Bell. Dan, thanks for coming on. Oh, thank you guys. I really appreciate it. I think everybody kind of knows who Dan is now. He's just been kicking everybody's ass in powerlifting. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, what was your what was your biggest total now? Oh, I got the biggest total ever, actually, uh, twenty five eighteen. That was that was knee wraps. I also took the world record uh, total in knee sleeves too. That was uh, twenty four eighty five. Jeez, you don't get a lot out of your wraps then. What was that? Uh, well, yeah, I got about seventy, well, sixty, sixty pounds out of my wrap, but I was, just had a good day, I guess. There you go. <laughs> There you go. So, we're gonna hit some news and stuff, and then uh, we'll get into Dan's origin story. Lonnie, what do you got for us today? Strength and muscle sport news. I've only got one thing that might be mildly interesting. <clears throat> I don't know. This is this falls under the Phil category of, you know, don't we already know that? <laughs> I think uh-huh. it's called "Show Me, Tell Me, Encourage Me: The Effect of Different Forms of Feedback on Resistance Training Performance." Um. Looks like a UK study. The first author's last name is Weekly, which I find a little ironic. <laughs> but it's about it's a strength study. Uh, anyway, um, it's W E A K L E Y. I imagine he gets his chops busted for that every once yeah. in a while. Uh, it says when performing resistance training, verbal kinematic feedback and visual feedback are known to enhance performance. And again, this is kind of what I was saying, Phil. Yeah. Like, you mean yeah. coaching? <laughs> <laughs> in addition, providing verbal encouragement can assist in the attenuation of fatigue. Okay. Um, however, it says the effects of these forms of feedback have never been compared. So that's like what this study does. I honestly find that kind of hard to believe. It, they've never compared verbal versus visual feedback. I'm probably missing something here in this summary. Um, but I, I'm guessing, at the very least, they analyzed this in a novel way. Their findings suggested that practitioners should, this is what they're saying, should supply kinematic feedback either verbally or visually, or when technology is not available, provide athletes with encouraging statements while resistance training. Well, we've been doing this for ever. Right. Yeah. Well, that's that, that's <laughs> what I mean. Um, I'm going to have to do a deeper dive because normally, right, th- our listeners know we plop down and I read some cool stuff lately, and I do the summary, you know, the skimming. I'm guessing there's something more here. I mean, I'm sure they're probably providing more evidence to this, right? I mean, Mike and I will often say, well, you got to do the science and like observe and record so you can inch forward. You know, it's it's one thing to say we always knew this, but m- maybe it's just good to submit some more information on it i don't know it says it says given these findings practitioners are advised to use either technology or verbal encouragement to manipulate acute training outcomes so 
I don't know. I guess you could be positive and say, Phil, you're doing it right. <laughs> well, I mean, you can even see this as you know, any sport. You get uh, a training day versus a competition day. All of a sudden, you have all these people cheering. Um, that's a lot of verbal feedback. Yeah. And generally, people lift better in meets. Some people fold, but uh, in, in general, lifters do better. That's and a good so point. Athletes. Not, and not uh, just a coach. I guess I was imagining yeah, it just as just... one guy. You know, one guy. No, and I see you. that as well. But, I mean, on the, at the extreme, all of a sudden you have, like at a football game, you have 30,000 people cheering for you. Guess what? You generally play harder. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah, that's a good so, point. But... Yeah, that's all I got, though. All right. Dan, we're going to get to you. Um, first off, how do we start with everybody? Oh, go ahead. Here's some like visual feedback. Like you would need a little bit more like technology, like to where look at like your movement in a different way to show like, oh, this is what you're doing wrong. Like you would always like the technology would have to be pretty crazy compared to what it is now to give like instant visual feedback on how you're doing. Like I, I completely agree with the crowd thing because I. I totally, that's part of the reason I like powerlifting is that platform adrenaline. So I'm almost addicted, but yeah, yeah. I, yeah the technology would be different. Sorry, didn't mean to. No, no yeah, no. to get total instant feedback visually? Yeah, that's what I thought. Uh, that'd be tough. I mean, because oh. you can get that from a coach, I guess, but it's not even instant. It's. Yeah, exactly. Uh, well, I guess. There's a mirror. I mean, you know, bodybuilders often squat in front of mirrors. That's instant visual feedback. It, that's not from another person, obviously. But, yeah, but uh, that not, can fuck you up as much as it can help you. Yeah. You know, is the problem with that. So. Yeah. No, I, you know, you guys would laugh at this, but for so many years, I mean, I just lifted at a gym where there's an old broken mirror in front of the squat rack, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And Rob would be like, let's just squat out of the uprights, bro. Mm -hmm. You know, and... Oh, my God, I could barely do it when we first started doing that. You know, I was, like, dependent in a way. It was kind of weird, but anyway, I'm sure powerlifters don't think that way. Yeah, <laughs> no. You got to get used to just looking at nothing so um, and feeling your way through it. But. And even when you have it again, it's weird. Like, I had to lift at the gym down here, and they just, you know, it's the old school gym, and they have a mirror in front of it. And, of course, you're facing forward, and oof, I didn't like it. <laughs> it was weird. <laughs> I'm not that pretty either. I don't want to see myself. <laughs> so, yeah, powerlifting should not be pretty. <laughs> yeah, no. Right. The faces you make, I mean, you turn purple and, you know, I know I feel like I'm about to die. I don't want to see it. <laughs> <laughs> don't remind me so, of it. <laughs> yeah. I don't need a visual reminder. So, um, no, let's get into Dan's origin story. So, basically, we always start off with everybody. What got you into just lifting and athletics at all? I was pretty at pretty athletic in high school. Uh, I was always like all conference football. We, I went to a super small school in Central Illinois. We didn't have didn't have much. I grew up playing a lot of ice hockey and um, uh, snowboarding with my family. And then, um, so I mean, I've always had somewhat of an athletic type, I guess, a, a, a body. I've always been kind of quick on my toes, but I've also always been over three hundred pounds. Yeah. yeah. And um, fresh out of high school, started playing a lot of rugby, and uh, that involved a lot more drinking than, than I expected, but <laughs> <laughs> it was a good time. Uh, and then uh, went to a technical school, graduated from that, and came back home, and I was like almost 400 pounds, just sloppy, to a completely different body composition than I am now. And one of my best friends was like, hey, if you started lifting and taking serious, you could, you could be a monster. And I'm like, oh, okay. Fast forward four years, I lost 150 pounds and uh, just saw this like little sheet up at the gym and it said, uh, enter, enter this push-pull meet for these tornado victims. So yeah. went and did that. I ended up deadlifting. I never deadlifted prior to that without straps, without over 600 pounds. And I ended up pulling 725 and uh, I was like, well, holy cow, I had no, no idea I was, like, that strong. And yeah. then um, I ended up benching, like, 425, too. And there was a bunch of guys there from Jack Hardcore Gym in uh, Montgomery, Illinois. It's a pretty popular powerlifting strongman gym in the Midwest. And they were like, hey, man, if you had any idea what you were doing, 
he could really be good at this. And I'm like, well, you know, like I'll give it a shot, but I'm just, I'm just here to have fun and like, uh, uh, you know, help these people and support the tornado victim or whatever. The next February started, uh, I entered, entered my first UPA meet there in Dubuque, Iowa. And, uh, yeah, it's been a roller coaster since I, t- I think totaled 1906 at that meet. And like, I had a bunch of people were like, Holy cow, kid, do you know what you did? And I'm just like, Squat bench and deadlift? I don't know. <laughs> 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 yeah. How old were you then? Uh, 27. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I just didn't really know what I was doing, but it was it was a lot of fun. I knew that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so fast forward to then, and, uh, you know, basically you've been hitting meat after meat after meat, and uh, we, we fast forward to today. So you did football, all-conference football. I can't imagine seeing you on ice skates. Yeah. How big were you on ice skates? <laughs> yeah, I catch that a lot. You'd be surprised. I, I don't know what it, if it comes from like the snowboarding background or whatnot, but my muscle, my leg development's been pretty, pretty phenomenal. I mean, I, a lot of people have talked about how large I do have a large set of calves for a bigger guy, but I've been carrying about around 350, 400 pounds for most of my life, so it's just. It makes that makes sense, but I do have some good speed. It's 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 wild. Yeah. I did, yeah. I just. What position did you play as a in hockey? Oh, I was a defensive. Deep, well, usually left defense or right defense, but a lot of times I'd move up to play wing too. Oh Jesus! I just couldn't imagine running into you on an ice rink, so <laughs> <laughs> or a football field, honestly, for that matter. But. Um, <laughs> So that you get under the wings of people and you know, what, what's your, it's hard to, it's hard for me to go further without getting into all these listener questions or feeding into them. But, uh, um, you've trained, you started up in Illinois and now you've moved down to Florida. What happened in between there? Yeah. Um, I was just, uh, I was just noticing like, well, this would have been two years ago now. So like 2018, 2017, I went to big dogs. Uh, that was, that was really actually very very like humbling to me you know to go against all the best in the world of course i mean i i tied for third with eric and alex simon and uh it was just a big a big thing that i wanted to do and it was good but i just noticed that my training and like my lifestyle was changing with with the seasons up there Mm -hmm. and um at that time i was talking to my now wife like we were we conversating and everything like that and we were kind of debating on you know did she want to move because with her job she could have moved up there and with my job i could move down here it was really no big deal and uh, i just noticed how my training was lacking and like a lot of life was changing not for the better like during the season changes up there so i was like hey let's just, let me go to florida try to get this 365 days a year of sunshine and see what that'll do for me and now i've been for two years and it's just it's a whole different life like i can remember like december november through december even through february up north to where i didn't even want to go to the gym i just wanted to go to work go home and, you know sit on the couch more or less it was just uh just the the, the weather it just made yeah. me not 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 too crazy about about training and stuff like that and i know like they, they have seasonal it goes with the mentality, but since I moved down here to Florida, I the, just the sunshine alone has helped my me perform, recover, and you know, and like want to want to train a little bit harder than I had been prior. Gotcha. Um, let's go ahead and go to the break right now because, like I said, I'm going to have a hard time not feeding into these listener questions. That's what we're going to do today. Instead of a topic, I just shot it out there to to listeners about you know what do they want to hear from Dan. So, I'm not going to go with Sounds good. Hello, dear ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, yeah, you know who this is. Uh, so I'm here to tell you about uh, Dr. Mike T. Nelson's uh, new book, uh, Why You Should Eat Keto. I don't do it because, I mean, look at me. Come on, I'm fabulous and I'm fantastic. Anyway, you should text uh, Keto ebook all in one word to 44222 to receive your free copy. Do it. Do it now.
Okay, listeners, after more than a decade of joining us on the podcast airwaves, you can now also become viewers on YouTube. This is not our usual simple backup of the audio show, but rather a growing body of video taste tests covering various foods of interest to nutrition enthusiasts, bodybuilders, and powerlifters. From within YouTube, simply search for Iron Radio Taste Test or Nutrition Radio Taste Test. In about 15 minutes, we cover taste and texture similar to other products, uh, usefulness to the co-hosts, and whether we would recommend the product to certain clients. You may even want to watch our podcast feed or Facebook group for which products are coming down the pike so you can taste test them with us. Join us for this new monthly project. Iron Radio is, of course, primarily a podcast. But over the years, there have been technical glitches calling for backup streaming and listeners who wanted the convenience of other sources of audio content. Toward this end, Iron Radio is now simulcast and backed up on YouTube. If needed, please search Lawnman07 or Iron Radio from within YouTube. There's not much video, but if you like to listen through YouTube on a Roku or other living room device, there you go. Like your weekly fix of Iron Radio? In addition to being a popular institute on iTunes, we are also on email. Simply go to www.ironradio.org and sign up for the voluntary email. You'll get a once per week email, no more, that's little more than the show notes and a link to the audio. So go for it. <laughs> All right, we're back, guys, and we're with Dan Bell again. And now, like I said before the break here, we're gonna we're just gonna do listener questions today, and I think these are gonna feed into uh, some more talking. And basically, I figured you know I'll let you guys lead us in what you want to hear from Dan. So um, we've got some easy ones, some silly ones, and then hopefully some that'll that'll lead into more uh, depth. But first one here is uh, Jason Pegg, which you know, he's a friend of the show. Uh, Jason's a, a fruit ball, but uh, he wants to hear about your training time with the Lily Bridges. Oh yeah, that was uh, that was in my early days. It was actually uh, actually my first meet. I took second place to Ernie Senior, and we were in the 308 weight class. And he's one that kind of like opened my eyes, and like I feel like he kind of took me under his wing a little bit. And uh, we still have a good relationship. I so he text me all the time uh holidays and stuff like that you know hey congratulations on your recent accomplishments and stuff like that he's um uh, when we trained together in illinois i think i ran up to chicago probably about four or five times and just uh just needed like a little guidance from him other than that we would uh, mostly keep it online or through text messages and whatnot and it was it was it was real nice um i was really Still really thankful that I got that guidance, especially from him, uh, Ernie Senior. He was great, but the, Eric was actually the first uh, coach that I had like bought and kind of paid for, and uh, he took me to my first 2000 total, and that was uh, early 2015. And um, yeah, I, I still like growing up in that area. I mean, just the the Midwest alone, how many strong guys are, are around that area? It's, it's just mind-blowing almost but the time that i had with the little bridges it was it was good i was i was happy it happened but then um like they kind of had a, a little demise there uh when when the one of their gyms closed down and a lot of you know the powerlifting drama was going left and right and I, there was quite a few of us who just kind of veered away from it and wanted to stay away from it but that's how it goes that's powerlifting and yeah. i think with the, the the rise of social media it's gotten worse but it, i try not to pay too much attention to it yeah just come out and lift <laughs> yeah. uh, a couple a couple of really easy ones here mark elder he just saw you at the kc showdown and he's yeah. like what what size shirt does he wear? That fucker's huge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
a lot of people are surprised like when I order order shirts from uh, different companies and whatnot or when I when somebody asked me do you want a shirt I'm like yeah I'll, I'll fit in a 3x if I don't my, my wife doesn't do the laundry that I should be good for a couple couple right. wears of it but if she gets a hold of it then I got one one good wear and it's a it's a tube top but normally I'll yell <laughs> them wear a 3x or sometimes if if they have a 4x i'll take that and cut the sleeves off and just i'm not swimming in it but yeah i have caught that quite a few times now being being a 4x now it's just a tough to find many companies that have or carry that size yeah what are you weighing now when you come in uh, to meet yeah right now uh well since that meet was five weeks ago the one in kansas city yeah. i actually had a little injury and uh I've been, you know, kind of watching, watching what I've been eating and stuff like that. And of course, down here in Florida, it's it's tough. My main focus is gotta stay is uh, stay hydrated. Just because I, hell, it was ninety two degrees two days ago, and yesterday it was seventy. So it's always been kind of warm. Um, I'm like right at three sixty three, so I've, I've almost dropped uh, twenty five pounds since that meet. Okay. Ooh. We got questions here from Ryan O'Hara. It's on the Iron Radio listeners page, and his is. There's like five questions in one, so we'll step one at a time here. How much hypertrophy do work do you do in your training, if at all? Purposeful hypertrophy work. Um, all my accessories are hypertrophy. Like um, when, when we go with the, the rip and rip and rip scheme, um, I, my Mondays are fully consisted of uh, bodybuilding movements, upper back and biceps, and it's all ten sets for. 15 to 20 reps and i've had that same monday for six years now okay and i really blame that on just like i blame like my my bench and my having that shelf to squat on my upper back growth and success just on that one day alone i mean uh, it, but it just for me it just feeds into my thursday which that's like how my training goes monday thursday sunday and that that monday like really gets all my muscles moving, gets all my muscles going. And it's kind of, kind of hard to say, but I've, I've only missed like a handful of them in the last five years. I, I thoroughly enjoy that Monday, especially getting towards the end of a week where you hit heavier numbers and you're just kind of dragging into the gym. And those months really get me going. They keep it fun for me. Yeah. No. And I think that's a resounding thing we've seen across the board. It's just everybody, people don't realize that from the outside perspective, they think power lifter, they think big, heavy all the time. And generally there's a lot of assistance work that's done for a lot of reps. And it's, you know, it's all that work is just done to build, build size and keep you in positions. You know, Phil, exactly. you guys, I think it's, it's a guilty pleasure. Power lifters like to be jacked. Don't pretend you're just about strength. You guys want to be beefy. <laughs> oh yeah. You want to look huge too. And it also helps. Right, yeah. yeah. No, you like can't Dan deny that it helps just to be bigger. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, Ryan also is wondering if we kind of already answered his Florida question, um, but do you ever foresee dropping to the 275 class of set records? Uh, well, I think the, the first one would be 308, and it, it, I, I'd be a liar if I said that uh, that didn't cross my mind. Um, it, it, I mean, of course, Eric's got those ones in the 308, and I'm not 100% sure with the way my leverages would change. I've been over 350 now for going on three and a half years. So it's just like making that full full commitment to get down there would be tough. I think I'd go the strongman route before I did that <laughs> just because I yeah. like being strong. <laughs> yeah, that, that's interesting. You ever thought about doing Have you messed around with strongman at all? Yeah, I've actually done two strongmen, like uh, smaller, smaller shows, and I'm pretty good friends with a lot of pro strongmen now. Um, you know, we're, we're all in the same game, really. So um, we uh, we always go back and forth and talk, and everybody they try to give me give me a hard time. Why don't you try strongman? Go ahead and commit to strongman, yeah. and uh, it, it, it'd be great. It'd be fun. It's just the last time I did one, like. Oh, it was 30 minutes after the show. I felt like I got hit by a train. Like, mm -hmm. it's just a completely different soreness. And yeah. the, the endurance side of it, too, is a lot a lot different than the uh, powerlifting. And, uh, yeah, I've thought about it. But I, I just got, uh, got some more some more adventures I want to check off with powerlifting first. And I know it would take most of, my, most of my time and effort to do yeah. that rather than trying to train both. Yeah. Um, 
again from Ryan. What limits your deadlift? Is it your finger length? <laughs> uh, no, my finger is actually pretty long. I think it's just from what for, uh, Ed and I have had a good conversation about it because Ed knows my background a little oh. bit. Ed, Ed Cone, yeah, he's been helping helping coach me these last couple of years and bounce ideas off. Is we have more of a friendship than anything, but I think it's more my overuse of my grip is mm-hmm. what gets me because I am I, I still do have a full time job and I'm also a mechanic so I'm constantly using my hands and if I have like like there was well November two years ago when I took the world record total I took that entire week off and just focused on mobility all that week and didn't really work too much so I think it's more just the overuse of my overusing it like the week prior and then not uh, having full strength for my grip. But my, my hands are pretty good size. I'm not going to say they're as big as Ed's. I don't know if anybody's seen those. Yeah. <laughs> he's got some monster monkey hands. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's got like catcher's mitts. Right. Um, yeah. Especially on a guy his size. So. <laughs> um, and you kind of fed into the last question that he has. The stretching foam work mobility work. What do you do? Um. Yeah, mostly uh, just contraction and trying to trying to feel the different muscle groups that I like in having full control. It's just you know, bands and uh, foam roller here and there, but like during training days, I try to stay away from the foam roller as much as possible, just just to try to f- feel out the movements more than anything. And like I was saying earlier with the contraction, just to know which muscle i'm needing to use know which muscle that needs to work uh i just try to focus on just that so if like it it means that i gotta grab a band and get my glute to fire you know one certain way then because it's not firing on that day like nobody really knows their body better than themselves i mean in in my eyes and uh, i feel like that's the way it is with me to where if I feel something's not moving right or something's not firing right, if I square that away and like look look and see which movement I can do to get that muscle to move and to work the way I want it to, because I feel like the more control you have over it, the more the more control you'll have over the bar, the barbell also. So that's just mm-hmm. like mobility is just I keep it low, but um, to to an extent I want to feel like I have full contraction of the muscles that I'm trying to utilize. It feeds me into like I know what I do and I know what have my lifters do. I've seen other lifters the week prior to a meet, um, or the week of a meet. I guess it is. Uh, what would you do lifting wise the week of a meet? Do you lift at all? Do you totally rest? Do you... Yeah, yeah. I take my take my Mondays and I cut them in half for reps just to not fully fatigue, but just get a good good um, good blood flow going on. And that's typically Monday. And then um, depending on travel. Uh, the Thursday or the Friday before, I will go in and, and squat about 50 to 55% just to wake up my muscles, you know, just to get, just to get them, get them rolling again, get, make sure that they're wherever I'm at too, you know, <laughs> just, to, yeah. just to make sure, because usually I'll take my last heavy squat two weeks out mm-hmm. and then I won't, I won't try to, I'll try to stay away from the straight bar until that Friday before or even that me day just because the way that the straight bar taxes my shoulders. And that's been a been a process I've had to learn here these last two years with the, the heavier weights I've been pushing on the squat. So, um, yeah, yeah, usually meet week, it's just light blood flow stuff and, you know, just trying to constantly stay stay moving. But that that squat, I noticed it's, help, it's helped me these last couple meets to where – you know, not just mentally, but also my my body. Like I got full function. I know exactly what's what I need need to do come meet day. And that's one thing I've noticed right there. I mean, you hit on basically the same thing we kind of do is um, you just about fifty percent move around and do the lifts. Yeah, I found if I take the whole week off, holy, I'm just I mean, I, I'm recovered, but I'm tight. I'm bound up. I'm, yep. I don't know how to move. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> exactly. Uh, like you know, go ride in a plane for four or five hours, or you go ride in a car for six or seven hours because yeah, I've been traveling to these traveling to these meets. You know, just stuff like that, the little things, and then you just 
just just got to move. Like, don't get me wrong, I'm I'm itching for the platform. Like, it it drives me nuts almost just not having that that last week off to yeah. not move and stuff. But yeah, the, by the time it comes around, I I just feel like I need to squat. I need to get that movement pattern in line for my head and for my body. Yeah. And this la- I got a question from Jen Bates. Um, and this will kind of feed into a longer one that we've been talking about recently about longevity of lifters. But what are you doing to keep your body healthy enough to squat as heavy as you do as often as you do? And she adds in, I mean, besides the obvious answers. So, <laughs> um, you know, we're already seeing your, I mean, your career, when, when, did, when was your first meet? How old were you? Uh, I was 27 and uh, it was like uh, February 2014. Okay, so, and you were athletic before that. So, I mean, you're, what, 33? 34. 34. So you're already 34. I mean, one thing we've talked about recently on the show a lot is we see a lot of young kids coming up, and they'll be 23 years old. And it's like, wow, this kid's got a chance to be good. And then by, like, 25, they're gone. They're just, (laughs) they're done. They're burnt out. They're injured. Um, Whereas somebody like Andre, hell, he's still just, he seems to go out and squat a thousand whenever he wants to. Um, and he's been doing it for like eight years. Uh, the longevity. And well, we talk about Ed's career too. You look at his career and he wasn't doing his best until he was, you know, mid thirties and things. So right. what are you doing different than a lot of the people are now? Do you think? Well, um, it's funny cause I really like can't particularly put my finger exactly on it, but I do have like a lot of my training partners have told me they're like, the reason, like, you can do what you do and you've, you've done it for so long, is I don't want to blame it on just strictly being lazy, but I think it's a, being a little bit smarter with training. If something feels wrong, I just don't don't push it. Like, yeah. if, if something feels off, I just, I just okay, hey, let's, let's be done squatting today, let's be done benching today, and I'll go hit an incline PR or go hit a leg press PR or just, yeah. just something fun on that one. Because I've had, like – kind of stood behind this i don't want to say if it's like a golden rule but i've stood behind this type of mindset to where i have to every heavy training day i have to leave the gym on a good note Mm -hmm. so whether it be like i've had plenty of training days where i failed my top set and i've had plenty of training days where my top set wasn't the prettiest but i would always try to leave on a positive note whether it be with that main movement or with an accessory so (sighs) I think that that's what's kept me in as long as I have been is just training a little bit smarter than the the meathead that, that I used to be because we, when I first did start I didn't know any idea about you know linear like linear or conjugate or anything like that I was just going in and maxing out every other day like you know a typical meathead and uh, slowing myself down and, and like kind of reassure myself that things are going to be all right in the long run as I think that's helped me a lot more than anything um, with the longevity type of things. And, you know, it's taking the time off when you need it, you know, especially like pushing these heavier weights. So there's heavier squat. It, I now with my, even with my peaking, I only squat heavy every two weeks. So I'm full. I feel like I'm fully recovered. I get a chew on that number like all week long on what I want to want to hit the next weekend. It's just, I think that that's helped me. And I don't know if it's if it's just me being lazy or if it's me being smart. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, uh, like you said, we'll never know. But I mean, <laughs> another thing that I've noticed just from the outside is we see a lot of people now um, getting caught up in being insta famous. And they're lifting for Instagram. And correct me if I'm wrong, but it looks like you generally, you kind of do what Ed Cohn preaches. You save those he- those crazy heavy lifts for the platform. Yeah, you um, have. To. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's no, there's no point. I mean, you only get so many shots of hitting, you know, ten fifty, ten sixty squats. So what's the point of doing them on in the gym if if it's not going to count? And I. I, I totally understand what you're saying with being the whole Insta Famous thing, and I, I, I like to say I've never really fed in it, fed into it, but I, I have, and that was like kind of in my earlier days. Now it's just like I don't even half the time I don't even record half my lifts. I get a, somebody else from the gym has 
we'll record them on their phone just like because they notice I didn't set my phone up because I'm I'm so into the lift more than I am to oh God, let's set up this tripod and set up my camera and get another yeah. camera over this angle like that I just I'm not I try to stay away from that because I, I I just can't get caught up into it and I don't like I get it we're where Instagram does do me like good, like lucrative money wise. I, I do have a few sponsors that have helped me quite, quite a bit along the way. And I very appreciate them, but it's just not, not my main goal. My main goal is to put the biggest numbers I can up on the platform. So it, it helps me more mentally to stay that way than uh, to worry about, you know, what's an in Instagram going to think about yeah. this. Yeah. What generally is, let's say coming up to your one of your world record, uh, totals how how close to that poundage do you get in the gym before you go to the meet uh, um uh, i hit 1063 in november and my heaviest squat prior to that was 1045 okay. and then, uh my bench it's uh, i think with bench with me i have to I have to stay a little bit more mentally ahead of it so my biggest bench was 585 and my my bench at that meet was actually 573 uh -huh. but my biggest pull prior to that was 881 and i pulled 903 at that meet also so it's just like with bench you don't and deadlift with bench and deadlift you don't know how much the squat in the same day is going to take out of your shoulders mm -hmm. and like don't get me wrong that that bench 573 was was, was easy for me it, it was a solid second attempt and um so I mean, it, I was just playing the numbers game, but I try to stay like I'll have a number in my mind, and that's the way I usually write my peaking program um, from 12 weeks out. Is I have good numbers in my mind, and then go by percentages. So it's usually like I like to stay up to about 97 to 98 percent of those numbers of my projected third attempts, and um, you know, say eight times out of ten, I've made those numbers my second attempts. So it's just. Um, by the end of the peak, and just depend on you know, there's been times too where I had to throttle it back a couple of weeks and hit the same numbers in a row just to stay stay on that peak. It gets me thinking here because I know, like, I think there's been like six lifters or some shit that have squatted 900 and deadlifted 900 in the same meet. Do you have any clue how many have squatted a thousand and deadlifted over 900? Well, I know um, Dylan Hel Helregal was the first. Yeah. Yeah, he was the first to do it in wraps, and I did it in wraps in July in the um, Pioneer Meet down there in Texas. But in February, I was the first one to do it in sleeves. Okay. Uh, yeah. So other than that, no, I think Dylan. Holy Dylan, shit! So the ones to do it. Yeah. So you guys are in a a very elite class. So, um, what's what's on the in your sites now? What are we now, training for now? Yeah, well, that uh, that meet in Kansas City, um, we were warming up, and I had a real real bad twinge in my uh, left calf. I really wasn't one hundred percent sure of what it was, and I knew I couldn't put too much focus on it because you know the, the platform it, it does get nerve wracking, especially yeah. when you're pretty heavy competition. There, like John Hack and well, Luke Nell showed up late last minute. He was a he was another little contender, so. Um, I hit my opener and I, it felt way worse. And I, I, I tore, actually ended up tearing. I had three micro tears in my left calf, which I got real lucky. The doc said if it would have been much worse, it could have been my whole Achilles. So yeah. now, yeah, now I'm just, I'm just hanging out. I've been, uh, been not training so heavy now these last five weeks. I've just been, you know, just hypertrophy, just trying to get a, a good pump and going to the gym for the camaraderie more than anything. Yeah. But I, uh, I really don't have anything in sights. I know uh, there's a big hybrid meet down here in February. I'm actually signed up for that. But uh, you know, I'm when uh, when we get over over a few more hurdles, we're going to get back into the gym and try to square some things away. I don't know if it's going to be a world record total, but, I mean, I'm going to give it a shot. I mean, there's, yeah. no point, there's no real point in me, you know, try, I, I, I just don't feel like going – to do, to do a meet and be mediocre or hit numbers yeah. that I hit is, 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 is purposeful. So, I mean, I'm, I'm definitely going to definitely gonna try, but I'm not going to press it to where I do get a, a, a more severe injury. I, I like to think, because I, I mean, like, 
kind of said a little bit earlier, uh, I've, I was on a good run, and I knew I needed some time off. I needed yeah. a re- recovery and get my body back in focus uh, prior to this. So uh, it, it was time. To, it was time. I'm just glad that it was this minor of an injury, and it wasn't something more horrific, where like a knee or an ACL or a shoulder or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so basically, the main goal, aside from getting healed up, is just keep slowly pushing that that world record total up. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I know, I know, I got a lot more in me, and um, I'd like to say, you know, uh, late twenty twenty one, I'd like to see somewhere close to twenty five fifty, twenty six hundred. I really think that that's possible. I'd love to, I'd love to squat five hundred kilos, um, and yeah. I mean, just by going off what I did last November, I really feel like it could be could be there. Especially if I if I stay in tune, if I stay good, good peaking wise. I, we got really blessed with the gym that we got. I got down here in Florida. There's so many like minded individuals, and there's so many chiropractors because we do have a chiropractor school down here. So I just um, just that that alone, and those those there's guys down here that are just such keen eye and they're technicians with the way they train and the way they lift. So I've been really blessed with, with those guys being able to bounce ideas and stuff like that off of them, off, you know, what's the possibilities here in the near future. So, yeah, that's, um, I'd like to say, you know, 11, 1102 squat, 600 bench and a 900 pull that put me right around 2,600. I think that's, that's real feasible. Um, whether it's going to happen, you know, 2021 or 2022, it might be a different story. Yeah. <laughs> that's probably yeah. <laughs> yeah, just see how things go. Yeah. Um, I got a question came in late here. Uh, on in your opinion, what is the biggest is, is intensity the biggest driver of muscle growth or volume? So basically, load or volume. Oh, uh, that's that's so tough and it's so scientific because um, I did learn through Ed that you you have to keep the intensity. I keep. Well, I don't, you know, have to, but I do keep the intensity lower on my high volume base, uh-huh. and uh, I do tr- try to bring my intensity a little bit more for the heavier weight days. Um, it, in my opinion, I'm, I'm gonna like gonna have to go with the the higher rep scheme, the high, the hypertrophy. You know, you're literally feeding that muscle group full of blood, and at the the, the end of the game, I mean, a big muscle can't be a strong muscle. So yeah. The only the the place that this topic gets muddy for me is there's a big difference in you doing like let's say okay I really need to get some hypertrophy in my shoulders so I'm gonna do some shoulder press or whatever with sixty mm-hmm. percent your sixty percent is light years ahead of somebody that's like max is one thirty five and they're like oh I'm gonna do ninety five pounds for four sets of ten <laughs> uh, that load comes into play at some point. Um, yeah, what I'm getting at is, you know, basically, I mean, what I like to tell people, I mean, I, I generally try and train if somebody's just weak, which everybody that starts out, they don't have a weakness. They're just weak. <laughs> um, let's take a minute and make you stronger. And then if we do sets of 10 with now, let's say you have a 225 press, you know, we're doing 170 for sets of 10. That's a yeah. lot different than 95 for sets of 10. Percentages are percentages, but they're not. You know? <laughs> you're getting so. the best of both worlds that way. And yeah. I, I, so. I totally understand what you're saying there. But And I think, I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, I think as you get further along in your career, like you can go lighter and get more out of the weight than somebody beginning. Yeah, exactly, and I feel like it's came to me over the years, but just the full contraction, and this might be the bodybuilder side of me too, and I don't want to admit that, but the full contraction of the muscle, like say, mm-hmm. you know, like lat pulls or something like that, when you can fully contract and f- literally have complete control over that muscle group, I feel like, in, the, in you know, kind of what they say about the squeeze at the yes. bottom, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I feel like that helps a lot more. I, I, I'll do lap pull downs with the 120 for 10 sets of 10, no problem. I just bang them out. But if I do it where I'm controlled and I feel it, I, I, I could feel taxed for the next two yeah. days. Just throwing a boat, you know. Yeah. It's just just being a, I would say, making the mature decision to 
to move it at a controlled pace it helps helps a ton no matter what though i mean the lighter the weight but i i totally agree with you yeah um i think we just had one more coming describe your first oh d- there you go just nash keegley and i know he's a uh, multi-play lifter but uh this listener to the show describe your first time in a bench shirt Oh, well, the first time I had one, it was uh, three sizes too big, and I I knew it was going to be awful just by just by putting it on. Um, yeah, it's nerve wracking. Anything yeah, you know, anything over five hundred pounds over your face is nerve wracking, especially when you you're trying to trying to figure out where the groove is and which way the shirt's going to work best for you. It, it was it was pretty scary. I think I ended up going up to six thirty the very first time. And uh, I mean, if you guys paid attention, my, my best uh, multi-ply. Sh- well, I use a single-ply shirt in that competition, but my best uh, shirted bench is six sixty-six, and it's just the the bench shirt's the only thing that really scares me when it comes to multi-ply um, squatting. You know, I you know, I do that with the lights off. Um, deadlifting, I I chose to pull raw just because. My raw pull's always been better, and I didn't want to overcomplicate something already that's pretty damn complicated. Uh, but the shirt, yeah, it, it's scary. It's it's pretty darn nerve wracking trying, uh, trying to figure it out. I'd 100 percent agree because I've been you know, I've been a raw lifter for I've been competing for 18 years, and I'm just now in the last seven months like messing around with the shirt and suit. Just like, fuck it, why not? I've been doing this for almost 20 years. Um, <laughs> why not try this? And holy shit, the bench shirt sucks. Yeah. It's just, it's it's not fun. It's, uh, like, uh, normally I can go in and like, okay, I'm going to go bench by myself. And it's like, N- not now. No. Not now. <laughs> I want to yeah. keep my face. Yeah. Uh, like, Hell, yeah. just getting out of the damn thing. Uh, <laughs> holy yeah. crap. But, I mean, you better not be claustrophobic. Whereas I can throw my squat suit on, I'm good. You know, I'm like, ah, yeah, let's do this. Right. It crushes your balls a little bit, but who cares? So, <laughs> don't need them anyways. Yeah. So, um, yeah. No, it's been good. You guys got anything else? I think we can start to wrap it up. No, that's good. Lonnie? You know, there's no, only, that's good. only one thing I was wondering about, Dan, is you're pretty athletic for such a huge guy. I mean, um, flirting with strong man, you're, you live somewhere where it's warm all the time. Uh do you do anything other than like the bodybuilding and powerlifting stuff now? I mean, recovery or just, do you ever get the itch to be athletic? You know what I'm saying? Oh yeah. Yeah. All the, all the time. I look for, uh, we got some neighbors who live down the street and they play slow pitch softball. And I've, I've done that most of my adult life, you know, who does love beer league softball. Uh, but I mean, it, it, I get the itch to try try that stuff. And then, Andrew Clayton, I don't know if you guys know him, but he's a pro strongman. He's from Jacksonville. Uh, I think it was uh, under 245 or something like that when he got his pro card. But um, he's a great guy, and he'll come down to Perfect Storm, the gym I work at uh, in Daytona. He comes down here every once in a while. And when I do see him doing the yoke walks and stuff like that, I I get the itch, and I, I join him a couple times just to, like, help him out. And, you know, it's, it's different movements for me. Um but yeah, yeah, I totally, totally understand what you're saying. Where the, I, I do, I do feel the itch all the time. But I know now that I'm getting a, getting a little bit older, it's not too wise to you know go out there and jump at a slow pitch game because my hamstrings tighten up pretty quick. Right, <laughs> yeah. right. If I don't get a good stretch out, there's also uh, adult men's uh, hockey league down here. And when I did move, I made sure I brought all my gear. I've I've had the itch. I've gone and watched a few of the the drop in games and stuff like that. It does, it does kind of you know get under my skin to where I want to get back into it again. But like I said earlier, I kind of got uh, kind of got a few more checklists I want to make for powerlifting, and uh, I feel like it's going to take my main focus to where if I do, I've I've done that before. Like uh, when I was living in Illinois, I played slow pitch softball the entire time I was training, and I don't know if it did me good or if it did me bad. But I, I you know, what's the point of doing it if you're not having fun? I mean, we're not getting million dollar checks off powerlifting, so <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. So. All right, well. I think we'll wrap it up there. Thanks for joining us. Oh, I really appreciate you guys. You guys um, had a great, great station, great podcast for the last couple of years. I love listening to you guys. You hope you guys keep doing what you're doing. Thank you. Yeah, we'll throw it up probably tomorrow. And I'll right on. tag in it. We can spread it around. So. Yeah, for sure. Love to help. 
Everybody Thank have you. a happy Halloween. <laughs> you guys awesome. Too. Yep. Thanks, nice, guys. Yep. Iron Radio is accepting donations. If you like what we do, the professors, the scientists, the bodybuilding show promoters, the athletes themselves in powerlifting and bodybuilding, um, please consider making a donation or maybe buying something from the ironradio.org uh, store. Uh, we also are accepting supporting members. So for $4 a month, which is frankly less than the bank sneaks out of your account in fees, you can step up and support a form of sort of public radio for the bodybuilding and powerlifting and strength community. The Iron Radio podcast and all of the audio on ironradio.org is for informational purposes only. If you're interested in starting a diet or exercise program, it's important to check with your physician. Also seek the help of registered dietitians, athletic trainers, and qualified exercise physiologists in order to make the progress that you need.